Welcome to lecture 16 of MCS 472 on industrial mathematics and computation. So today we go kind of halfway again into statistics or perhaps a little bit more fashionable data mining. Um, we will consider a regression. So we actually have seen a regression in a numerical analysis course. I will try to summarize how what we remember from numerical analysis. And even if you haven't taken numerical analysis, it's kind of the lower layer under the packages. Uh, so what is important for this course is that you can understand what the model does, what regression does, and how to use it. Uh, the numerical linear algebra is nice, but not the focus in this course. Uh, numerical linear algebra is taken care of in the software that we will be using. So I will end uh, with two proposals uh, for project uh, topics. Um, and there will be more to come in the next lectures. OK, um, so what are we looking at? So we solve over-determined linear systems. So what does this mean? So we have a matrix and a vector. Uh, the matrix A is a rectangular matrix, uh, typically with many more columns than rows. So the M is at least N. So M is the number of rows. N is the number of columns. Um, the right-hand side is an M vector. So we want to compute a linear combination of the columns uh, so that... Um, we obtain B. Now this will in general never work, um, so it's an over-determined linear system. There is no exact solution. Instead we can formulate this as an optimization problem and minimize uh, the difference between the right-hand side and the linear combination of the columns, so the product of A with X. And we do this in the squares sense. So there are two twos. Uh, we use the two norm. The two norm is just uh, the technical term for the usual length of a vector. And uh, the upper two means that we don't take square roots. So when we look at the minim minimizing problem, it's a very well-posed and uh, very well-defined problem. In numerical analysis, we have the householder QR as a direct method, as a numerically stable method, uh, also in cases where the matrix itself is nearly singular or close to being singular. Uh, there is then the iterative method, uh, the GMRES method, um, which should be applied when the data sets get to very, be very, very large. The minimizer uh, translates into an orthogonality condition. So in particular, the difference, what we try to minimize, that what we call the residual, is perpendicular to the column space of the matrix. So that's the orthogonality condition. And in essence, uh, there are, we will see in a minute, so there is a, a black box solver there, and this works just as well for polynomials or exponentials, or as we will see later for more general periodic uh, functions. So that's in a nutshell, uh, what is the numerical linear algebra view on this problem? Uh, in a numerical analysis course, we spent several lectures on this. Here, that's it. Uh, so what is important is that at the lower layer, um, there is the backslash operator uh, available in any Julia session built in 
in the linear algebra module. Um, the linear algebra module is not even needed, but you would need it for the norm. Um, so I illustrate this slide here illustrates the backslash operator on a three by two matrix. So I generate a three by two matrix. The semicolons suppress the output. So it's no use to look at random numbers. Uh, we compute a residual vector. And you see that the residual vector is actually far from being zero. So if you solve any square linear system, then if the matrix is regular, is not singular, then that residual vector should be close to zero. Here it is not. Now, instead of the residual vector, we can compute the transpose of the residual vector r, so this is this r prime, and multiply this with a. So you see that r is a 3 by 1 matrix, the transpose is a 1 by 3, so the multiplication is well defined, and we see the numbers are very small. If we read the numbers from the back, we see that they are of magnitude 10 to the power minus 17. That's below machine precision. Okay, so that's the computational view of things. Um, now, for the remainder of this lecture, we could continue to work with the backslash operator, uh, but we can have wrappers around this when we work with uh, data frames. Okay, um, how does this now apply to the fitting problem? Uh, so what is the uh, geometric uh, and also the application, the geometric interpretation, but also the application for looking at data sets? Well, we want to see a trend in numerical data. So we have a data set, a two-dimensional data set. So the little n from the beginning is 2. We have m. Uh, data points, and we want to compute uh, a slope. Actually, we will compute more than a slope. We will also compute an intercept. So we compute a linear approximation. So this will give rise to a matrix with m rows and two columns. So the m is at least two, but as we will see in the experiment, it's actually many, many more. So what we want is that we have our observed y, and then we have the a times xi plus b, computed with the a and the b, from the solving of the linear system. So what is the purpose of this? What, what do we get out of this? Well, if the slope is positive, then the data will actually be increasing. Okay, so let's see how we can experiment with this. Here is a plot. Um, so what I did in this numerical experiment, I took uh, a line with intercept 1 and slope 0 0.5. So the blue line is, if you like, the exact data. And then I added random noise to this, uh, normally distributed. And you see the red dots is the data. So it's not observed data, but it's it's representing uh, something, a cloud point, uh, a point cloud, if you like. And uh, the green line is the fitted data. So it's kind of a coincidence that that green line passes through one data point. Um, so if you run this, and the Jupyter Notebook will be posted, you should see each, with each run, if other random numbers are generated, you will see different plots. But I hope that always you see that the green line is also trending upwards. Uh, so the slope here was actually a bit less, uh, but it's still more. Um, so it's still going up. Um, and there is a plus missing here with the intercept. Okay, uh, great. Um, so that's the geometric interpretation 
of uh, the fitting and how this can be uh, interpreted, how, how it can be applied. So the red dots, uh, what can you say about them? Well, they actually are going upwards. Uh, but if you would look at dot, if you would hop from dot to dot, it's not really obvious that that is the case. Um, okay, so this is the uh, Julia code, uh, step by step. And here you see I missed the plus. I will still fit this, uh, fix this. Uh, so there is also the range. I'm making here my exact line and the dot plus is important. So this is the component wise addition of uh, the multiplication of a scaled range. And you see the random noise. It's normally distributed. Uh, so the normal numbers have a mean zero. Um, with um, average but but that that mean is actually uh, the, the mean is actually going minus 0 0.5 so th there is actually a noise that that attempts to shift that line down uh, the size of the noise is determined by this uh, parameter 0 0.2 the scatter plots plots the noisy data um, as red dots and then you see the backslash operator after the definition of the linear system so the view that we take here is still very much the linear algebra view we actually see the matrices um, in what will when we continue with data frames uh, we will actually not that much see the the matrices um, Okay, and then we have the final plot, um, and that gives us this plot here. Okay, um, uh, we are not restricted to linear fits, um, although here the application is that a linear fit can be obtained uh, to fit the parameters in an exponential model. So we have some data. Uh, the T here suggests that the data is depending on time. And we have two parameters. Uh, now, we want to determine the two parameters. Uh, so the constants, the two constants, one in the exponential and the other in uh, front of the exponential. So the exponent, if you like, and the coefficient in this uh, model so that the parameters actually fit uh, the data best. Okay, how do we do this? Well, we, the data, if the data is growing exponentially, then from numerical analysis, we know that dealing with very large and very sm small numbers, that may lead us into trouble. So if we take the logarithms of the numbers, uh, so at the left side here, we will take the logarithms of the observed uh, data, the data that is, uh, so is given by the fi. So we are going to try to fit the data ti fi with some exponential model. So we take uh, at the left, uh, we will take the right hand side vector b will be the logarithms of the observed function values. At the left uh, we will have the parameters uh, so you see that uh, now it becomes a sum that is linear in t. So the natural logarithm of c1 this will be a number that we will compute so that will be the intercept. The slope computed as c2 will be the exponent, the argument in the exponential function. Why is that useful? Here is um, an example. So there is Moore's law. Moore who predicted that uh, the amount, uh, so the, 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 the number of transistors and also the uh, power of the 
uh, CPUs would actually double every two or three years. Um, so uh, the point is uh, apply the mathematics from the previous uh, slide to the data in the table. So I took this table from Wikipedia. I selected roughly of every year uh, the uh, uh, an Intel processor um, and the data had the transistor count in there. Um, you, you see there is some regularity in the beginning but then you had to drop in 2005 and 2005 might have been uh, the year where multi-core came up. Uh, so Moore's law is still um, valid uh, if you consider uh, multi-core. Um, so, and I stopped at 2010 because then the multi-core model didn't really work that well. But if you would go to GPU computing, then you could still see that Moore's law is still holding. But let's keep it simple. So, there is also a point in this that I would like to make is that uh, today, if you want to keep on uh, getting the benefits of the progress in technology, you must uh, consider uh, parallel computing. Okay, but for this course and for this modeling exercise, um, fit the above data. So uh, we will work with two logarithms. Um, so what is the exponent C2? Um, so Moore's law is actually, it's not exactly two every two or three years, uh, but you should have a fit. Um, so uh, this to, to solve this exercise, uh, make a scatter plot uh, that uh, shows the scaled data. Uh, for the years, they start at the year 2000. Uh, perhaps it might be better to start at zero. Or might, with Julia, you might perhaps be thinking starting at one. But that, so the, the logarithms will help and also the the, the, the years, instead of working with 2000, 2010, uh, work with numbers from 0 to 10. Okay, um, now uh, we can, with regression, we can predict uh, data. Um, so we will consider a uh, linear uh, regression. Uh, so on Friday in the next lecture, lecture 17, we will consider other models. Um, in numerical analysis, we have ordinary and partial differential equations. In statistics, and one talks about ordinary least squares. Uh, so this refers to the uh, linear uh, regression. Okay, so how do we do this now um, with uh, data frames and more within the world of statistics? So I will be using the data frames packages and the GLM package. And I'm taking an example from the documentation. So the first example that I found. Uh, so we are looking at uh, the data one, two, three and uh, 2, 4, 7. As this is now being represented as a data frame, uh, they are 64-bit integers. Okay, so that's our data frame. Uh, it's a 3 by 2 data frame. So in the copy and pasting, uh, some information got lost. Um, I'm building a linear model, OLS. OLS uh, stands for the ordinary least squares. Um, for numerical analysis, it might be interesting to look at uh, the pivoted Koleski that's being used here. Uh, interesting. Um, so we, we, we actually looked at the normal equations and the matrix there tends to be positive definite and Koleski is a good method for that, uh, but that's an aside. So what is the output? Uh, so the output is then the intercept and the slope. So the intercept is minus 0 0.6666, uh, which we recognize as minus 2 over 3. And the 
slope is the 2.5. Um, the next column is then the standard errors, uh, which gives you somehow a confidence on uh, how good uh, what the errors are on the on the slope and the intercept. Um, there's other statistical data there uh, that I omit uh, now. Okay, uh, so where does the name predict come from now? Uh, well, we can use the model to predict uh, the data. Um, so that is actually the, 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 the numerical fit with the line. So we have the three numbers, one, two, three. If we represent uh, the data set with a line, then evaluating the model, so the, the, the slope, the line presented by the, uh, by the slope and the intercept, then you get the prediction. So you see it is here explicitly worked out. So, um, and the plot might have been in order also here, uh, but I didn't do it here. Um, Okay, we are halfway in this lecture and we haven't really seen much of the uh, real data, except of course uh, the Moore's Law, but that was an exercise. Uh, so I mentioned data frames. Uh, so the first time that uh, I introduced data frames in this course was in lecture 5. And then uh, the question was, um, if we look at data, are the winters in Chicago becoming milder? Um, so in that lecture, I took a data set from the National Weather Service, uh, copied and pasted into a text file. So we looked at the average monthly temperatures in Chicago over the past 100 years, so starting in 1922 and ending uh, last year. Um, so are the winters becoming milder is then translated in looking at uh, the temperatures um, the monthly temperatures and trying to fit that data. So it's kind of also trying to uh, see the trends. Is there a warming trend? Um, okay, so uh, what did we do in that lecture five? Um, so the data was copied and pasted with spaces in between. Um, so the delimited files didn't really have any problems with this and the temperature, the December temperature, uh, was uh, seen as uh, retrieved into a matrix uh, where the 13th column uh, listed the temperatures in December. So that's essentially the beginning of the winter. And then uh, let's look at the plot here. Uh, so these are the average temperatures in December. Um, in lecture five, we pointed out that the 80s had some very uh, cold uh, average temperatures already in December here. Um, but uh, you could see that in the last 20 years, uh, so the, the 100 here, uh, you should subtract, so the 100, so the plot is actually not so good. Uh, I should have uh, relabeled, uh, so the year 0 is 1922, year 100 is the year 2021. Um, so the last 20 years, you could kind of imagine, but it's a bit of an imagining that you have to do, that there is a warming trend. And we could kind of also see this when we did... Uh, the looking for the warmest uh, temperatures, uh, seeing, observing that uh, the, the, the representation of the later years in that 100 time span, the, 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 the highest peaks here, although again, if you look at the really highest peak, you have it in 1923. Um, so, but then there are a lot of peaks that occur, and, and also the, 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 the warmest, so the valleys were actually not so cool, cold anymore. Can we kind of uh, quantify this a little bit better? Um, so in lecture five, um, the purpose was to show that data frames are actually very good 
way to sort so we ended uh, with that uh, sorting was kind of nice and then i called also data frame spreadsheets for programmers here is our data frame again uh, so why do we make uh, data frames now uh, because it's kind of nice uh, to use with the GLM, the Generalized Linear Models. Um, now, however, there is a wrap. Um, so, on our data, everything was of type any, because somewhere there was in the first row, there were uh, strings there. Uh, and then the general uh, data type to store the entire matrix was just to use any. So we can do a fit on 64-bit integers. We did this already, but we cannot do a fit on data types that are any. So here we have the data type conversion that is better done when we create the data frame. So we had already the December temperatures. So the, the plot, by the way, did not have any problem with the any type. Uh, so the plot was quite robust. Uh, the data frames are actually not so robust. Um, so, or, or the, the data frames are itself very robust, but not the uh, fitting. Um, so for that, I had to convert to 64-bit floats. Okay, so these are always the problems one can run into when one working with real data. Okay, um, so then here it goes. Uh, we fit now the average uh, data temperatures uh, with uh, our linear model uh, using the ordinary least squares um, using that formula. Um, and uh, the first thing that shows is that, hey, over the entire 100 year period, uh, the slope is really, really, really tiny. Uh, so 0 0.00433. Um, the intercept is kind of, uh, the meaning here is kind of the average uh, temperature. Uh, but you still see that the standard error is actually still kind of large. Um, so uh, this is wildly fluctuating data in some sense. So even though the data is already taking the average daily temperature for every month, uh, so there's already smoothing uh, factor going out. Um, all right. Um, so now, uh, how do we? So I could have done the predict, but I, I realized this only later um, when I grabbed the coefficients and then I built the line. Uh, this has the flexibility that you have to think about what it is that you really are doing. Uh, so it's important here to have the range correct. Uh, so with the plotting, I have to I then go to the default 1, 100. But actually, the, 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 the actual range, if you start evaluating, is the 1922, the 2021 range. Um, and these are the predicted values by the model. And here you see that the slope, I mean, if we wouldn't know it actually, uh, we would almost think that, depending on how you hold your head, that the red line is actually a horizontal line. Um, so over the 100 years, uh, the average monthly temperatures, they actually stayed uh, about the same, uh, which is actually not what we think it should be or what we observed um, then let's look at the last 20 years um, so we select uh, from the last from the data uh, the last 20 so starting from the end so the end counts as well so that's why I take minus 19 uh, we need to have 20 numbers exactly 20 um, we make a data frame and then redo everything. So this has the benefit of recapping a little bit. Uh, so um, while it's good when we practice this to smear still everything out in different coding blocks, uh, if we work in our Jupyter notebook, 
in the end, uh, it's good to see a summary of what we did. We took the data, the years, the temperatures, we built the data frame, we built our model, and then we selected the coefficients. And actually, the slope is now actually quite larger. So we will actually notice this in the plot as well. Uh, the intercept is actually kind of a warning here. Um, you should not plot this over the entire years because the data is only valid uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, so uh, the plot, the extended plot here uh, that will be uh, shown on the next slide is actually plotting for the range in the last 20 years. So here it is. Uh, the red line is the uh, data over the 100 years. And now over the last 20 years, we have the green line segment. Uh, you see there that there is a noticeable trend. Um, so there are more sophisticated uh, data plots that one can make. Uh, so you kind of almost see that the data it fits within uh, a band. Um, so I don't think that I have shown the output. So again, look at the Jupyter notebook. Uh, the standard error uh, would actually also say something about uh, the band. Um, so, and, and I think you could also try to visualize that um, with the stats plots. Okay, so two exercises now. Um, so segmentation, one can perhaps uh, look at uh, the data um, broken up in periods of 20 years. Uh, so complete this plot. Uh, so it might even see that we have a cooling trend uh, in the years leading up to the 80s. Uh, so the 80s were pretty cold. Um, so it could be that you see there uh, something. Um, it could also be that the 20 is rather arbitrary. Uh, so you may as well even say, well, wait, uh, it might be worthwhile. And I remember doing this also for lecture five uh, to break it first in half and then do some kind of bisection there. Uh, so adjust your code so that you can work with any divisors of 100 and make these uh, segments uh, with on every segment you show the result of the linear fit. So exercise 2 is more of a curiosity. Exercise 3 is more of a programming exercise. Okay, so that is our technical introduction for today into linear regression. I will end uh, with um, where this fits into uh, data mining. Uh, so what is regression now? Um, so in there is a modeling view of data mining. Then the regression is seen as one of the important tasks. Uh, so one of the three tasks in this modeling view. Uh, the modeling view uh, identifies the other task as classification and clustering. But regression is a task of predicting a numerical target attributes, which represents some quantity of interest. Uh, there are some uh, quantities of interest. So uh, this section here uh, goes into the economic uh, side. So the two examples that I copied were amounts of monies and uh, costs and gains. Uh, so regression is indeed very important for the economy, but also for the industry. So you can also m look for uh, quantities of interests. Um, so this is the view on data mining, uh, where one tries to predict. Uh, so you can predict existing data, but you can also predict new data, or you can uh, make your data model from a subset of your data. Um, so uh, this linear uh, regression uh, is already very important uh, in machine learning.
so there is some terminology. So we started uh, this course with statistics. Uh, so populations, observations, variables, and samples uh, are actually words that we uh, are maybe familiar with. In data mining, you will encounter the words domain, instance, attribute, and data sets for the four counterparts in statistics. Uh, so this is a uh, kind of indicating uh, where this fits um, fit with the double meaning here, where this fits in the literature. Um, so in lecture five, I mentioned uh, the Julia Data Science book, um, which is still very much recommended uh, should you want to learn more about both Julia and uh, data science, data frames. Um, I got the data mining algorithms uh, textbook through our uh, UIC library. Um, so, and what I summarized in the uh, previous slide is kind of a, a very short uh, digest. Uh, so you shouldn't learn, you shouldn't read that entire book. Um, so this is where uh, the source uh, comes in for what was on the previous slide. Okay, so this now uh, concludes this formal part of the lecture on uh, regression. So I could have called it linear uh, regression or ordinary least squares. Um, now, what are potential uh, proposals now for projects? Topic. So I will explain this in the next uh, five minutes or so. Um, so there's a lot of data available. Um, so we live in the time of big data. Um, so government uh, data, uh, there's a lot of free, there are a lot, many, many free data sets out there. Um, and they keep on growing. Um, so here is a population fit. Um, so take the census data for starting already from 1790 to today and find uh, so for every year you will have the population in millions uh, so in in a way there is the time of big data but if you look at uh, the time measured in decades um, so the, the the data set is actually not that large um, so and there is the time in decades uh, so if you like you could also work in year by year um, so then the following questions um, so in a polynomial fit uh, so you can do this polynomial fit also directly by taking one extra column in your backslash operator uh, so where the extra column wouldn't be the coefficient with the x square term, etc. So the first question here assumes that there is a best degree of a single polynomial. And uh, that might be kind of, so the, the, the question is, it's certainly growing. Um, was it growing linearly, uh, quadratically, or cubically? Um, so instead of one single polynomial, so there are certain periods where the population would be declining, I would be thinking of a war, uh, then would perhaps a piecewise polynomial model not be better? So there are also times of economic progress. Um, so there is the trends, so there is the baby boom after the Second World War. Uh, could you for example, zoom in on that baby boom thing. Um, so a little bit similar to, so you can also take uh, the approach that I suggested with the weather data, where you still use piecewise linear fits. Um, so the, the piecewise linear fits have kind of, so where for every uh, decade, so you could bundle the decades, uh, you would take linear fits um, that has the advantage of working with a slope and the question is then that you always ask is the population trend going upwards 
or downwards. Okay, so the second um, suggestion for a topic would be the corona uh, pandemic. Uh, so there are plenty of data around there. Um, it's a, it's for for the mathematical purpose here. It's in order to have another uh, model which is not now polynomial, but there is exponential growth in the infections. Uh, so we had several surges in the pandemic. Um, is there an exponent in a surge? Uh, so can you actually quantify that one surge was worse than another? Uh, again, you can segment uh, the data um, in this uh, case. So these are two possible suggestions uh, for two projects. So there are a lot of variations. So you can look at essentially any data set and look for uh, either a trend if you think about linear regression uh, but also for a characterization um, polynomial degree or the exponent in the exponential growth so this is a 50 minute time uh, slot but i could do it in 40 minutes i hope this was clear enough and clear and interesting enough uh, to get a feeling of uh, what is the uh, linear regression. On Friday, we connect uh, more again to our periodic data. And we are going to see Fourier series, which connects to the topic of the fourth week, where we considered the discrete Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transform. And then we actually said with signal processing that every signal can be decomposed as a, um, a sequence, as a se sequence, as a series of signs. Uh, so there we took that kind of for granted. Uh, on Friday, I will show how to uh, build that uh, sequence. Uh, that series with Fourier series. So that's another time, uh, that's another uh, application of fitting, of regression.